All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Building Blocks for Success, How to Have It All Work. Thank you for participating in this workshop this morning. It's so great to have you here with us. My name is Amber Howard, and it really is my pleasure to be your instructor today. I thought I would share a little bit about myself before we kind of dive into this morning. And I will also let you know how to interact. You may not have used GoToWebinar before. So, as I said, my name is Amber Howard. I am a, a certified business analyst, project manager, and change manager. I have my own consulting, coaching, and training company, and I work with clients in both the for-profit and not-for-profit sectors. Uh, some of the things that are really important to me are having people get that they don't have to be stuck in life and that they can have whatever that they want, that they can really live a created life. And this workshop actually got born out of COVID. I created this workshop um, and this webinar is just kind of a, an overview. This is actually a, a day-long workshop that I do with people who really dig into these topics. So you're going to get a little bit of taste of what, we're, what, what the content is this morning. But it really got born out of my desire to make a difference for people when the pandemic started. So I asked myself the question, what are some of the things that people might not know or might want to learn about that would make a difference for them in dealing with what they're dealing with, what people were dealing with at the beginning of the pandemic? Like, how do I pivot my business or how do I create a new schedule given that my life has changed and I'm now having to manage life differently? Or how do I come up with new ideas for sources of revenue? So that's really where the Building Blocks for Success came from. And it really is an honor for me to get to have this time with you more this morning. So for those of you that are new to GoToWebinar, you may not have used this platform before. You can use the questions to ask any questions of me or put any comments. I don't believe the chat function is available, um, but please feel free to put any comments in the, in the questions if you have anything that's kind of coming up for you or that you're discovering as we go through the morning. And if I look over at my other screen at all, it's just because that's where I can see the questions and who's, a, who's here and, and if you need anything so that I can make sure that I'm taking care of you this morning. Um, I'm going to go through the content. There's kind of a lot to cover this morning, even at a high level. Uh, if you do have any questions, please put them in the chat and I will try and address them as I go. And if not, there will be a time to ask questions at the end. All right. So the things that I'm committed that you walk away from this morning is the importance of having measurable goals. Right, what we measure grows and we measure the things that are important to us. So it's important for us to be able to know, especially for those of you that are entrepreneurs, that how did I, did I do a good job today? Did I get my job done today? We're also gonna talk about mindset and I, I, I start any training with a conversation around mindset because it doesn't matter what we do if we're not taking the actions from an empowered place. We're going to talk about scheduling and I invite you to consider when did you learn how to schedule to have your whole life work? This is not something we teach children really for most of us who are, you know, we start out in life, we have a schedule in school, maybe our parents keep a schedule for us, then we go into work and often we schedule our meetings, but there are so many different areas to our life. So where do we schedule to have our whole life work? We're going to talk about brainstorming. And you're going to learn, if for those of you who are new to the technique, how to generate ideas to achieve your goals. We're going to talk about one of my favorite techniques that I learned from the world of business analysis, which is also really used in, in project management called decomposing. So oftentimes people go to start their, like start creating a plan for a goal, but they haven't broken it down into manageable pieces. So we're going to talk about that this morning. We're also gonna talk about how to create actionable plans to achieve your goals. And then we'll end the morning by looking at what are the steps for executing that drive success? So what are the things that you can do ongoingly day in and day out that are gonna have you achieve your, the results that you want and achieve your goals faster and with a greater sense of ease. 
So this is kind of our agenda for the morning. We're going to talk about goals and then mindset, and then we're going to move through the content of the course. And at the end, we're going to wrap up and we're going to talk about next steps. Okay. So oftentimes when we set goals for ourselves in life, I invite you to consider that the kinds of goals we set for ourselves are the kinds of things that we know how to achieve. Right. Or maybe, you know, we there's things that we want, but we don't know how to have them. So we're afraid to say that we want them. And I believe based on my experience and years of, of, of work and, and training that the point of having goals, like the real reason we create goals is not to achieve results. But the reason we create goals is to be able to grow and expand. And if our goals are not worthy of our life, or if our goals are not big enough, then they don't cause us to have to expand. So I invite you to be here this morning, right? It's Saturday morning. You could literally be sleeping still, or you could be sitting out on your deck, wherever you are, you know, having a coffee, doing anything. There's so many things that you could be doing and you chose to be here. So I invite you to be here in this conversation this morning, present to a goal that you have right now that's important to you something that you're looking to achieve in your personal or your professional life. And ask yourself, is this goal one that's really worthy? And you can feel free to type it in the questions so I can see some of the things that you're working on right now. But is this goal really big enough? Does it scare me a little bit? Does it force me to have to really look and see like give up knowing how to accomplish it. And the goal could really be anywhere in any area of your life. It could be around your health and well-being. It could be around your business. It could be around having a romantic relationship or it could be a travel financial goal. But just look and see if the goal that you have right now that you're working towards, and maybe you have a couple of them, but look and see if those goals are goals that are big enough to cause you to have to grow. See, I, Bob Proctor says that typically there are three types of goals. So the first type of goals are the kinds of goals that I said. People will set a goal that they know how to achieve already. So it's like you want to buy a car, but you choose a car that you've already purchased in the past. So it's something that you know, you already have brain patterns for that. So typically when people step up or level up from goals that they know how to achieve, they choose goals that they think they can achieve. So if the planets align correctly and all the things fall into place and I have the right strategy, then I'll achieve that goal. The problem with goals of this nature is that there's no inspiration in a goal that you know how to achieve or that you think you can achieve, sorry. There's no inspiration in a goal that you think you can achieve. So then we move on to type C goals. So the highest level of goals are goals that we don't know how to achieve. And the reason we want goals that we don't know how to achieve is because we have to expand in order to fulfill the goal. Yeah, so just looking at your comment, you're so Nina, your goal is to create structures for my business. Right now I have a product, but I don't have a structure to run the business. Really great. And I suspect that this is something that you haven't done before, right? So you're going to have to learn new skills and new awareness and new tools in order to be able to achieve that. It's really great. So wherever you are right now in this conversation, whether you have a goal or you don't, I invite you to just to be in this conversation, like inquiring into the kinds of goals that you have. That's a great goal. And is that, Paula, to earn 100K in revenue over the next year, is that something you haven't, haven't accomplished before? Yeah, really great. So you're gonna have to, like Nina, this is great to see, right? Some of the goals are going to be in like structures for business. Other goals will be financial. And for both of you, you're going to have to cause an expansion in who you know yourself to be in order to achieve those goals. It's really great. So wherever you are in this conversation, I invite you 
to just be looking from that place either like what is my goal and and do i have clarity around it is it specific can i measure it is it relevant to what's important to me is it time bounded right do i have because for us to achieve our goals there has to be a time in which the goal is going to be achieved. So by the end of the year or in six months or by the next quarter, whatever it is. And is it achievable? Now I want to say something about the achievable part. Remember is that they have to scare us a little bit. So if you know that it's achievable, it's kind of like, it can't be a goal like I want to create a unicorn. Because unless you know something that I know, it's not achievable to create a unicorn. But it's got to be something that our, and we'll talk about, we're going to talk about mindset next. The goal has to scare us. And at the same time, it's got to be something that our subconscious mind will allow us to believe in the world of worlds that it's possible. So perhaps, like, if, we, if you'll allow me to use, use an example, Paula, perhaps for you, if you were to say earning a million dollars in the next year, all, although out in the world that is possible, for you, it would be pushing your belief too far for you to actually believe that you could achieve that in a year. And I'm not saying you, you couldn't believe that, but it has to be kind of achievable in our own mind or we'll just sabotage ourselves. So I spent the beginning part of my career really getting trained and developed what I would call professional training. So, you know, I got certified in business analysis, project management, change management, and, and all of those things were very valuable in allowing me to help with my, my customers, my clients, the companies that I worked for. But, and over the last five years, I've kind of stepped into what people might consider to be more personal development. So I've started studying things like neuro-linguistic programming and cognitive behavior therapy and mindset. Because what I've discovered is, you can have the best plan in the world. You can have a plan that would achieve success, but if in your own mind, you don't believe you're worthy of success or you don't believe you're capable, whatever you, you'll never outperform your beliefs. So this last five years, I've really want, been looking and inquiring into my own mind and the mind of other people's so that I can bring together both of these things, right? Having the right tools, frameworks and, and knowledge in order to be able to really serve people and at the same time being able to really help people understand what is the kind of mindset and beliefs that are going to set people up powerfully to be, have, be able to have what they want. What's important to understand about our own minds is that we are in our subconscious mind 94 to 96 percent of the time. What does that mean? Well, has anyone here ever been driving somewhere and they've gotten into your driveway and you can't remember how you got home? It's not that you were distracted driving. It's literally that you were on autopilot. See, for the living of our life, the majority of the time, the things that we do as human beings, our mind, like our, our participation, like the, like the conscious part of us is not required. Because thinking takes a lot of energy and our brains are trying to conserve as much energy as possible because they have to make sure that they manage our entire body and all of the different things that our body and brain needs to do. So the majority of the time we are running brain patterns from our past on autopilot. We have habitual ways of being and acting. So Consider that you, the you that you say you are, is actually not required to, to live the majority of your life. Now, that's not in and of itself a problem, except for most of us have some pretty unhelpful brain patterns that we run, limiting beliefs about ourselves, about life, literally about everything, about being a parent, about making mo about money, just sit and look for yourself right now. What are some of the beliefs that you hold about money, about success and happiness? Where did those beliefs come from? Are they yours? Did you create them or were they inherited? 
So the reason why we want to start, I always start the conversation with mindset is it's so important to understand that it's not about just about the actions that we take. The majority of our success, in fact, 95% of success comes from our mindset. You can have the best strategy in the world and still fail if you don't believe in yourself. So now that we've kind of laid a little bit of the foundation, we're going to talk about scheduling. So you can just put in the chat or I think you, not sure. Sorry, I'm a little bit new to go to webinar. I've used go to training a lot, but um, you know, you can just put in the chat who here has a schedule. The chat's not active. Thank you, Paula. Who here has a schedule that they, you know, everything in their life gets scheduled and they keep to their schedule. Pretty much they're reliable, you're reliable to keep to your schedule. You can just put a comment in the question box. Maya, really great. Thank you, Elsa. Paula, bare bones schedule? Okay, good. You keep to your schedule and it's flexible, Meredith. Okay, great. Nina has a schedule, really good. So by the way, I don't really come from there's a, a right or a wrong way. I'm not saying that, you know, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to consider some things about scheduling that you may or may not have thought about. And I'm not saying for those of you that don't keep a, you know, a, a firm schedule or have everything scheduled that there's anything wrong with that, okay? But back to what I said, and back to what I said earlier, Typically, most of us were not taught how to schedule our lives in order to have our whole life work, right? Our parents managed our schedule when we were little. When we got to school or high school, we started to get a schedule that was given to us by, the, by our teachers and by, the, by the, our educators. If you work in a nine to five job and you're, you do meetings and stuff like that, then you have a work schedule. But consider that there are so many different areas of well-being. We have our physical well-being. So, you know, working out, eating well, drinking, groceries, like all of these different things related to our physical well-being. We have our intellectual well-being. So you're taking care of your intellectual well-being by being here this morning, right? Or what are we learning, our training, our development, our studying, whatever that looks like. And I, I personally choose to be in and believe in the value of being a lifelong learner, right? But how are you tending to your intellectual well-being, your emotional well-being? Are you giving yourself space and time to take care of your emotions and, and depending on what's happening in your life, you know, time to, to rest and, and time to, to release maybe some of the emotional energy that, that's been building up? What about your spiritual well-being? This is in a conversation about religion. And if you are religious, that, you know, it could be that. It could be going to church or Bible study. It could be meditating, getting out for me, getting out in nature, being near water is very important. It could be to my well being, to my spiritual well being. Inside of your spiritual well being, we're also looking at do you have a guiding purpose for your life that really has you feel like your life has meaning for you? Your environmental well-being, right? Does your space reflect the kind of environment, the people in your space? Is it organized or not the way that you want? But are, is your environment set up to have you achieve the things that you want in life? Your financial well-being, right? Do you have time scheduled to take care of the things that you need to financially month in and month out or week in and week out? And not just in terms of like managing the current affairs of your finances, but looking at what are your financial plans for the future? What is it that you want to accomplish financially in your life? Your occupational well-being, right? Are you in a job that you like or a career that you like? Maybe you're an entrepreneur. Are you in a business that brings you joy and happiness and has you feel fulfilled? 
Do you have time scheduled? Not, you know, do you have all of the things scheduled around your occupation? Not just the time you work, but travel time if you have to go see clients. And then finally, social well-being, right? This is your, your family, friendship, social circles. Do you have time to spend with those that you love and that fill up your cup and allow you to, to really feel connected? So what's important to note about all of these areas of well-being, that in order for us to experience optimal satisfaction in life, all of these areas must work to the degree that you decide it's important to you. And that's gonna be different to every for every one of us. Some of you, your physical well-being may be your biggest priority, and so you wanna spend the majority of your time there. For other people, it could be work and your occupation. For some people, it will be spiritual. But to whatever degree you decide these areas of well-being matter, they have to be getting tended to and taken care of. This is really about living our best life. So if it's important that all of these areas work, I'm asserting, and nothing I say to you is ever true, but something to try on, that they probably need to show up somewhere in your schedule. Because for anyone who gets up to any kind of big life, and I know the majority of you that are on this call this morning quite well, your people, and, it, and the fact that you're all here at 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning, I'm going to assert that you're all big people, like living big lives. It's important that it's important what we schedule gets done. And typically what people do, typically what people do is they schedule the things that are like rigid, you know, maybe work appointments, doctor's appointments, and then they try and fit everything else in. Now, some of us, and I invite you to consider right now, have a context around being heavily scheduled. It's like, I don't want to be, and this used to be me. Like, I didn't want to be controlled. I didn't want to be told what to do. I wanted to be a free spirit. And the busier and busier I got, and the more and more I tried to put onto my plate, the, the more things fell through the cracks or the things that, like my well-being was one of, is typically the first thing to go as a mom. So I didn't mention that earlier. Most of you know, but I have three kids. They're 25, 24, and 15. And for those of you watching this recording, you know, typically my well-being was the first thing to go out the window. And guess what? It was never scheduled. So just putting something in a schedule doesn't ensure that it will get done. But you are way more likely to do the things that you schedule than the things that you don't. So the first thing you want to do in building a schedule that works for you in your life is define your requirements. And we're going to talk more about that a little bit. So, like in each area of these well uh, in each area of well-being, what are your scheduling requirements? How much time do you want to spend each work, each week, tending to your spiritual well-being? How much time a day, if that's, you know, do you want to spend around your physical well-being, whether that's in meal prep or working out or going for a walk, whatever that looks like for you. For my entrepreneurs in the house, how much time do you want to spend working each day? Typically, sometimes I find entrepreneurs kind of default to nine to five because they typically come from the corporate world and that's what they're used to. But if you could live your dream life, how many hours a day would you be working? How many hours a week? You want to make sure, so the first thing you do, and I invite people to go find somewhere quiet with your favorite beverage, wherever it's relaxing for you, and just write out all of your scheduling requirements. And then you're actually going to develop the schedule. And I've got a tool that I use that I can, um, that I'll, I'll talk to you about in a moment. It actually looks at your life in 15 minute increments, which I think might be scary for some people, but I found it very freeing. So you want to develop your schedule. And I invite you to start by putting you in first. Because I promise you, you will make sure to take time to take care of the kids, your other responsibilities, work, all of those things. But if you try and put the thing, like the things that are important to your well-being, your emotional, spiritual, social, in after, typically those are the first things that go. 
And then you want to put that schedule into existence once you've created it. And I invite people to kind of create it weekly for the month because sometimes you've got appointments that are monthly. But I'm inviting you to consider that like you could absolutely create your schedule and have it be your own because it really is your time. So this is just that we're not going to hang out here too long, but this is just an idea of some of the categories or some of the things. And I'm not saying it has to be, but you know, how much time do you want to spend on training and development? How much time and what are the activities you're going to do around fun and play? What are your work times? What about family? Social, working out, all of these different things. And again, like when you're going through this and you're doing your schedule requirements, you want to look, are there any areas of well-being that are not covered? Have I considered all of the aspects of the task, right? Not only am I like doing the food prep and cooking, but have I considered getting the groceries? How's that gonna get managed? And then once you're done looking at your schedule requirements, you know, you could kind of inquire with yourself, are you satisfied with how you're choosing to spend your time? So this is a template I wore through a palette. <laughs> Some of you might look at this and be like, uh, I'm not saying you manage. This is actually an Excel spreadsheet template that I share with my clients. And if anyone wants it, I can and make sure that you get a copy of it that you can adjust. So you set the start at end time. And I don't suggest that you manage your day-to-day -day schedule in this, but I, it's a tool at which to create. Because one of the things that I've discovered is that for most people I work with, once they put everything in their life into a, into a tool like this, they realize how much white space is actually left over because there's a lot of things that you can get done in 15 minutes. You can schedule it, you can, what, you know, you can take a shower in 15 minutes, you can meditate, you can read. I read every day with a friend of mine for 15 minutes at 7.30 in the morning. You can do a workout, you can pray, you can contact clients. So once you see how much white space is actually left over, then there's a, it's less overwhelming. And you can kind of play. When COVID first hit, I literally, because I gone from being someone who was like out three, four nights a week and my schedule was just like, jam-packed with work and other commitments, I started using this tool to be able to look and see how I was managing my energy. Was I taking care of my well-being? Now, there's always an exception that proves the rule. So there may be some of you watching this who when you do this, if you were to do this exercise, you discover like, wow, like every single square and it's by the way it's not that you have to do everything in 15 minutes some things that you do are going to go over a 15 minute period of time and you would just block from the start to the completion but some of you might discover like wow there's very little white space and then that's an opportunity for you to inquire for yourself like especially if not all of the areas of well-being are covered off what are some of the things you might start saying no to so that you can have greater satisfaction in life. So I'd love to hear from a couple of you in the chat. We're gonna move on to talking about brainstorming now, but I'd love to hear from you and some of you in the chat. What value could you see? Or you know, do you have any questions related to scheduling? And just a reminder, like this is typically a much longer workshop. So when we do it, we, we actually go through these exercises together. But this morning, I just wanted to give you a taste of some of the concepts and the ideas that I know will give value to you. So brainstorming, for some of you, is probably not new. You may have done it before with, you know, in, in your workplace or in, in school. And I know that there are a number of people who are not familiar with this technique. So what is brainstorming? Well, brainstorming is a technique used to foster creative thinking. So you created this goal. 
right? You have a goal. You want to, you know, Paula wants to achieve 100,000 in revenue this year, earn 100,000 in revenue this year. Nina wants to, um, Nina wants to bring structure, more structure to her business. Some of you, I noticed, said that you, um, some of you said that you weren't 100% clear what your goal is. Guess what? You can use brainstorming to help get clarity about your goal, okay? So what's great about brainstorming is it helps with the creation of many different ideas up front. So I'm just looking at some of your comments. So it's interesting to look, yeah, well, 15 minutes is a big block of time. And I know for, I know a number of you are moms, you, you can get a lot done in an hour. But when you bring it down and you don't have to schedule every minute, like I am not even suggesting there should be white space, I believe, not should like have to, but it works when there's white space because sometimes breakdowns happen and you don't wanna be scheduling every moment, right? Meredith, I noticed resistance to uh, going into scheduling all of the non-work. Yeah, it's great because, you know, one of the things that I know from my training is anywhere there's resistance, consider there's something to discover there, right? What's the resistance about? And you could play with it, right? This is why I invite people when they do this exercise, go somewhere calming, relaxing to you, have your favorite beverage with you. I, I, you know, the, the template's designed in such a way that you can print it off. It prints on an eight and a half by 11. And then you could just like really get into the spirit of creation. Like you're creating your life so that all of the things that are important to you are tended to and taken care of. Really great. Thank you for your comments, everyone. So another thing that brainstorming is great for is that it helps to identify patterns and themes for further discovery. So when Zoom, we're going to talk about how you brainstorm in a moment, but this is something that's used by different sectors. It's used a lot in, in, in business, in, the, in, the market, in marketing. It's really great for getting a group of people together and getting people's creative juices flowing. We typically brainstorm in groups. You don't have to. You can actually do it on your own. But what's great about brainstorming in groups is you and I only see a percentage of all that's possible. And I might see a percentage if it was a circle, right? I might see a, a sliver, Nina, Meredith, Maya, you know, you, Elsa, Paula, you all might see a different sliver. Sometimes our slivers overlap. You'll find that with people who spend a lot of time together. We tend to create agreements around what's possible with one another, which in some ways is helpful. In other ways, it can be a little bit of a lid. But when you get out and you talk about something in dialogue with other people, you discover that there are more ideas that you thought of on your own. So to conduct a successful brainstorm or an effective brainstorm, there's kind of really three steps to this. So the first thing is preparing to brainstorm. So you want to define the area of interest and you want to keep it fairly narrow, right? Like you want to, kind of look at a specific clear problem or opportunity statement. You wanna make sure that there's a time limit for how long the brainstorm's gonna happen. So half an hour, 45 minutes, depending on the group of people you have involved. You wanna identify the, 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 the best people to participate. So if I'm looking at brainstorming around my finances or how to create financial results in my business, I'm gonna go look out into my, my network of conversations, my social circle, and I'm going to identify those people who are achieving the results I want to achieve already. Because those are going to be the people that are most likely to be able to offer you ideas that are going to be able to help you. And especially around the area of finances, sometimes that can be a little challenging. Sometimes we're a little, we could have a little bit of embarrassment around our financial results. But I promise you that people want to be a contribution and want to support you. And your, your best bet at being effective is to talk to people who are doing what you want to be doing, the people who are a gap for you, just like you're a gap for people in other areas of your life. And the last thing you want to do in preparing to brainstorm is, can, is, to, is to establish your evaluation criteria. So you're going to generate all of these ideas, so many. You're going to generate like an abundance of ideas. And then you want to be able to know 
well, which ideas are now, am I going to go forward with or not? So you identify the, the criteria by which you'll decide which action, which ideas to move forward with ahead of the brainstorming. And then you get everyone in a room. Typically, you set some ground rules about, you know, create the session, how it's going to go. And the idea is when you enter the brainstorm, no idea is a bad idea. Everything goes up on the board. You allow people to build on it, other people's ideas. Even if people say the same thing in a moment of excitement, you just, everything goes up on the board. In the brainstorm, we're looking for quality, quantity of ideas over quality. You want to keep the conversation focused, make sure it's a safe space, find a way to display the ideas as they're being generated. So typically what I like to do is like um, post-it notes are a great way to do that. And all of the ideas go up. Then when you're done with the brainstorm, when the time is up, you start to discuss and evaluate the ideas. You might even categorize the ideas together. For those of you who are, you know, this is a great technique, typically done on your own. If you're looking to write a book, you can just write all of your ideas on a piece of, on a sticky note, like any idea you have about the book, any thought, wisdom, whatever content, you just write the idea on a, a post-it note and lay them all out on a wall or a table. And then we do an exercise called like affinity mapping. So which ones go together and those actually form the basis for your chapters for your book. And then, you know, you can look at the order, the structure that you want the chapters to go in and then you have your guide for when you're writing. You rate each of the ideas when you're done. And then you use your evaluation criteria to determine which ideas you're gonna move forward with or not. And then depending on in a professional setting, like if you're doing this at work, um, oftentimes people will have some kind of follow-up, right? You could email the group or like, what are the actions coming out? Who's gonna take those actions on, et cetera. So the benefits of brainstorming are you get an abundance of ideas quickly. It allows you to have an expanded view of what's possible because you're stepping out of your view of the world. It allows you to build teamwork and it can be fun and break up your routine. One particular technique for my for brainstorming that I really love is mind mapping. And I'd love to hear in the chat if some of you have mind mapped before. I use mind mapping for everything, whether it's coming up with plans for, you know, like just dumping ideas, trying to find ways, like, you know, if I'm moving, I've used mind maps to create all of the, for my projects, I use them. So mind mapping is a creative technique that allows you to see the connections between and like articulate and capture thoughts, ideas, and information. It's a form of nonlinear thinking and note-taking. And you can even, some people who are like super creative types even use like color and pictures and images to create their mind maps. In the longer session, I go through a number of different images to show you the different styles. But basically the idea here Basically, the idea here is that in the center, you have whatever your goal is, right? So, so Nina, for you, I noticed you said you had done this before, you could put like building structures for my business in the center of the mind map. And then, well, what are the different kinds of structures around, right? Do I need structures around like tech, is it around technology? Is it around time management? Is it around social media management? Like what are the different structures, categories of structures I need? And then if there's any sub ideas or what you could do is even like start like identifying the ideas. So what are the, what are the different components of social media management? What are the different components of administration? And then it's great because you've got this visual display and then you can even use that to look at and define how you're going to, how you're going to, who's gonna take those actions. You know, those of you that know me, I'm looking to grow my business right now, and that looks like building my team. So it doesn't have to be me that follows up on all of those things. So I, I think mind mapping, if you haven't gotten a clue, is so fun. 
I really enjoy it. And you can do it on your own or in a group with other people. So before, you know, I'm going to move on to decomposing right now. If you have any questions or comments about brainstorming, if you've done it before and you love it, there's a really fun, something called the money game that you can play. So you, you know, you get a group of people together and you say, okay, I need $10,000 in the next week. And you brainstorm, like, what are all of the ways, illegal, legal, immoral, moral, all of the different ways that you can come up with $10,000 in a week. And you brainstorm them all. And then when you're done, you go through them all and you say, okay, I'm get, I'll, you know, I'm going to sell these items. I'm not going to sell my kidney. Uh, you know, you go through and you make, you decide which actions are you going to take. And you don't stop until you're certain, no kidding, like willing to bet your house or something else if you don't own property that you'll achieve getting that $10,000 in the week. Because it's no different with money, right? The, the ideas that I have to generate money is are very different than, than what else am I come up with or, or Maya or someone else. So we now, right, we started, we have our goal, we've scheduled time to work on our goal, we've brainstormed ideas about how to move forward with the goal to achieve it. Typically what people do next is go into planning. They want to create the plan. So there's an important step that I think a lot of people miss, which I call de in, in, in the business analysis world, it's called functional decomposition, but it's this idea of breaking something down into manageable pieces. Because if I said to each of you right now, go build a house, develop a plan to go build a house. And by the way, estimate for me how much time and, and money and how many resources you need to build a house. That would probably re be really overwhelming for most of us. Unless you're someone who builds a house on houses for a living, just saying to you, I've got this goal, go build a house, build a team and go build a house, you wouldn't know what to do. Well, decomposing allows us to be able to break goals down into manageable pieces so that we can then plan them more effectively. So it's used to reduce uncertainty, and we can use it to break down processes or systems, functional areas, goals into simpler parts. Our brain likes small pieces. So you're actually helping your brain achieve your goals by giving it more manageable pieces. Functional decomposition also helps us identify patterns and themes for further discovery. Typically, and again, in the, in the longer session, I go through lots of different versions of this and this, I'm just, typically it's a visual display like the one you're seeing here. It's typically hierarchical, right? If you have your, your long-term goal, this is used in project management all the time. For those of you that are familiar with project management, it's called the work breakdown structure, right? But we have our long-term goal at the top and then our sub goals, and then how do those break down? So you could use this, you know, if you have a goal around losing weight, at the top, you would put your goal of losing weight, at the right, whatever that number is. And then what are the things that you need to consider? Well, what do I need to do around my nutrition? What do I need to do around exercise? How am I going to track? Maybe there's something to look at around measurement. Maybe there's something to look at around resources. Maybe I need support, accountability, coaching, a trainer. Another version for those of you that work, have worked in corporations, you may have seen this kind of display, but it looks like an organizational chart. So you have the president or CEO at the top and all of the different departments. The same technique is being used. It's just called different things in different environments. So as I said, we use functional decomposition to break down complex ideas and makes it easier to work with others. Functional decomposition allows us to more accurately estimate and measure things. Right? So because we typically break things down until we're at a level of work that can be done in a specific period of time. 
So usually between eight hours and 80 hours, you don't want to break things down too small because then it becomes like micromanaging. But you break the, the work down into deliverables or, you know, sections. And then it's much easier to estimate and, and assign who's going to do that work. So you first start by asking, what's my objective? Why am I doing the decomposition? Is it about designing something or analyzing a problem? Is it about estimating or forecasting work that needs to get done? Or is it about optimizing to improve the quality of something? Then you wanna understand what is it that I'm decomposing? So is it a business outcome? Work that needs to get done could be broken down into phases, milestones, tasks. Am I decomposing a process or a function? Or am I decomposing a product or a service? Then the next thing you want to do is what level do I need to develop to? So how deep do I need to go in the functional decomposition? If you're doing a work breakdown structure, as I said, typically that's any work that like tasks or deliverables that can get caused between eight hours and 80 hours. So a day and two weeks. Sometimes people go as low as half a day and a week's worth of work. The guideline, it's not a rule. The next thing you wanna ask is how am I gonna display it? So typically displays like the one I just showed you that hierarchical breakdown is really helpful. And then you go off and you do the work and you have fun. So I got, for some of you, decomposing is maybe new. You, you may or may not have heard of it before. It really is one of the biggest things because then you can take the breakdown of the goal into, or whatever it is that you're creating into smaller pieces and you know what there is to plan for. And you know what actions there are to take and things that you need to consider. And it's the first step in being able to estimate more accurately how long things are gonna take, how much they're gonna cost, and how many resources that you're gonna to need to do them. All things that you need for a great plan. You are welcome. I love the, I love a good work breakdown structure too, Nina. Maybe makes me a bit of a geek. So Antoine de Saint Exubery said, a goal without a plan is just a wish. Right? We can have all of the things that we, you know, all of the goals that we want, but if we don't understand, like if we're not clear about what the actions are to take, we're not going to be very successful in achieving them. So a proper plan provides direction, not just for you, but for the other people that you're working with or interaction, interacting with. It reduces the risk of uncertainty. It reduces waste. So they say that for every minute you spend in planning, you, you save 10 minutes in execution. Proper planning improves our decision-making because we're giving ourselves the time to go through and think about all of the things that need to be considered. It allows for the most efficient use of our resources. In fact, often helping us come up with, you know, maybe seeing things that we hadn't seen before. So I love this image. For people who ask me what I do for a living, this is what I do for a living. And I do this with my coaching clients. I do this when I train people. I do this with my consulting clients. But all of us have some place that we're trying to get to, some desired state, the future we're looking to live into. And then we have where we are right now. So for each of you, instead of these goals that you want to achieve, there is like the desired state, what your goal is, and then where we are today. And we want to understand what the gap is. Because once we understand the gap, we know what actions there are, what solutions that we need to create in order to close the gap and move us forward towards our goals. So there are really three things that are important in coming up with any plan. And we could go, guys, I, I spent a whole week training project managers on, on planning. So you're getting 
like the really, really high level here. But consider, you know, there's things to consider like change management, communication management, risk management, quality management, so many different things to create a good plan. But at its core, there are three things that really need to get managed, right? One is the resources. Who are the people, the team that we're gonna be using? The other one is our schedule. And the final one is our budget, our financial resources. So for the people, who do I need to support? Who's gonna be on this team? Who's doing the work with me? And for solo entrepreneurs, like for those people who are watching this, who are working on their own, I invite you to consider like there's more resources and support out there available to you. I'm like recently having this big breakthrough, you know, in my own business. How do I build a team when my business has kind of gotten to the point where there's not much more I can do on my own, but yet, and I have all of these ideas and opportunities to generate more revenue, and yet I may not be earning enough money yet to be able to support paying other people. And I think lots of companies get to that point in time. So how do you create team? What does that look like? What are the skills these people need to have? How am I gonna hold them accountable? What's, so the first thing is who, who are the people? And then what's their role? Are they clear? Do they understand what their role is? What are they gonna be doing to contribute to achieving the goal? When are they gonna be doing it? How long do they need? How much time is it gonna take for them to do the work? And part of the what is also helping set expectations, right? Helping, helping people set expectations. And then finally the how, like is there anything I need to consider about how they're gonna do their work? Do they need any specific tools? How are we gonna communicate, right? What's the environment that needs to get created in order for people to be able to work effectively together? For scheduling, right? So what are the estimated times that it's gonna to take to do things? How long is each action or task or, or deliverable gonna take each part of the plan? Are there any dependencies, right? Like, oh, I can't actually build the walls of this house until I've laid the foundation. So you're thinking through what the dependencies are between different activities in the schedule. Do I need any breakdown time? Do I need to build in contingency? Because I, I've estimated, you can't build a plan without estimating. So for whoever said, whoever assumes make it, makes it AS, whatever, we actually can't plan without making estimates and kind of taking a stab at. We don't know everything. So, but the level of our contingency, and that must be in relationship to how confident we are in our estimate. So if I know it takes me 50 minutes to take a shower, I probably don't need to build any estimate, any contingency into that part of my schedule. But if I'm traveling to a client and I've never been to that client's location before, and I don't know exactly what traffic's gonna be like, I'm not as confident in my estimate, so I need to build greater contingency into my schedule. So there's a relationship between the level of confidence in our estimate and the contingency that we put into our schedule. And then finally, how are you gonna display it? Are you gonna use like a Gantt chart? There's tons of free software out there. If anyone has any questions about that, feel free to get in communication with me. But how are you gonna display the schedule and keep it present for yourself? And then finally, our budget. <laughs> yeah, I know, you and I are like the same kind of geek, Nina. I love me a good Gantt chart too. So typically our budget needs to account for in, in, in you know, the work that I do, we call it the total cost of ownership. So it's typically what are your upfront costs to get something off the ground, whether it's product, good or service or a software solution, or, you know, so what are any upfront costs that you must need plus any cost to operate that thing over time. So for you as entrepreneurs, do you need to pay for any upfront licenses for software, but is there a monthly charge? Right, so what are the ongoing charges for something? So you wanna consider that when you're planning your budget for how much you're gonna spend on things. So there are any, like we, you know, we look at goods, hardware, materials, software, products. We also wanna look at software apps, products, uh, sorry, professional services. So do we need any trades or experts or support? 
from different professional services, marketing. And then again, we see this like ongoing operations costs, right? For those of you that again, work on your own. And typically when we start off, we have like, I'm not gonna spend more than this. It, it's not worth it for me to spend more than this to achieve my goal. So then you, you may not have exact cost for everything at that point, but you definitely want to, you definitely want to have some ballpark of what you're, what you, what you're not going to spend more than. I also love this image. So whenever you're planning, I invite you to begin with the end in mind and you're going to work your way back from, right? So you're standing in the future fulfilled. I've successfully completed my goal. I've created that $100,000 in revenue this year. You want to get emotionally invested in what that feels like, what's now available in your life and hold that vision in your mind. It's very powerful for manifesting results. But then you're going to look back from that place and ask yourself some questions. Like, what are the things that could have gotten in my way and didn't? What are the resources and skills that I needed to pick up along the way? What people did I need to attract? For those things that could have gotten in my way, what were the strategies I used to overcome them? So beginning with the end in mind, not only allows you to create a powerful vision for the future that you can live into, it also allows you to see those pitfalls and the things that might sabotage your results now so that you can do something about them before they happen. It's a powerful place to stand in planning. I always include this in planning. It might seem a little out of context, but like the Reiki diagram for those, this is a technique, I think it's helpful in families for whatever, anyone who's working in groups of people, and I'm a really big geek, so I used a Lord of the Rings example. But it's the idea that it, it works for holding people accountable and managing work when you have a clear sense of what the tasks are to get done coming out of your plan, and then who's going to do that. And then it's like, who's, who's accountable that that thing gets done, right? Who's responsible to make sure it gets done? So the accountable person isn't necessarily doing the work but they're, they're on the hook to make sure that it's accomplished. And then who's responsible? Who's the person who's doing the work? <laughs> and then who do we need to consult along the way to get their input? Who do we need to consult along the way to get their input? And then finally, who needs to be informed about the decision? And I know we said we're gonna end at 11. If you guys can, if you don't mind, I may take another 10 minutes. I hope that's okay. Um, and if you have to go, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate your time and I hope you got value out of being part of the webinar this morning. Um, of that. So the RACI diagram, the RACI diagram is just such a powerful tool for anything. It's typically used in projects. This is the one thing I recommend to any company. If you don't have this, it's such what we call a low hanging fruit. It's easy to implement and, and makes a really big, can make a really big difference. But you can do this, for those of you that are parents, you can do this with chores around the house. I just think the RACI diagram is such, a, and the RACI stands for Responsible, Accountable, Consultant, and Informed. All right, so you've got your plan, right? You know what you're gonna do, you know how much money it's gonna cost you, you know what your schedule is, you know who the team is that you need to do the work. And now I'm gonna talk about like, you're actually doing the work. And it's funny because for a lot of people, the fear comes up now, right? Like in the planning stages, we're all fine, but when it comes time to actually execute, that's when we start to bump up against some of our fears around success and some of those other things. Zig Ziglar once said that you don't have to be great to start, but you have to start to be great. So what are we doing during executing? Well, we're completing the work. We're updating our plan ongoingly. We're managing any changes or risks that happen along the way, possibly taking corrective actions.
we're communicating with all of the different people that need to be communicated with, with our teams and our partners. Remember that changes happen, life happens. So just because you create a plan, this is why resilience is so important, right? Because we have our expectations of how life's gonna go and then we have the reality of what happens in life. And the bigger that gap is between our expectation and our the reality is how disrupted we get. But if you know that things happen, life happens, things are gonna change, then it gives you this freedom to be out here in life, just dealing with whatever's happening and, and dealing with the breakdowns from that place. So some of the questions you wanna ask yourself during this phase, is work progressing? Like, am I progressing against my plan the way I thought I would? How are we performing? What is missing? So I stopped looking at life through the lens of, is there anything wrong? Or are things good or bad? I just don't find that to be a very powerful or helpful frame anymore. So more often than not, and I'm human, so sometimes there are things that are wrong, and those of you that know me know that that's true. But more often than not, I try to look at life through the, through the lens of what's working or not working, and what's missing, that if that was put in, it would make a difference. So the other question you can ask from this place is, will we meet our objectives? There's lots of tools that you can use for tracking progress. Many of them are free for my entrepreneurs out there. You know, for those in the more corporate setting, Microsoft Project is a pretty powerful one, but there's even, you know, Monday, there's so many different, Asana. I like Trello. Google has a free thing called Google Keep for doing, for keeping to-do lists, which is very powerful because it's associated with your, for those of you that don't know, like Google's constantly creating new tools. So, um, like check it out. And the same for those of you in the Microsoft, if you're if you use Microsoft Office or the Microsoft Suite, they now have calendar, like a, an equivalent for booking meetings, like Calendarly. So if you're paying for Microsoft, you want to go look. And if you're paying for a Google Suite account, you want to go look at all of the different tools that are available as part of that and see what else you can leverage for your business. Nina mentioned smart smart feet. So there's so many different options that are available to you. Again, it's important to measure and keep track of where we're, how we're doing against our plan, not from a place of judging or making it wrong, but just so we can know. One of the most important things to do in planning, like in executing, is tend to your team. Take care of your people. Because as leaders, they're the ones doing the work. I'm managing a project right now for a healthcare organization. And it, you know, it's, it's, it's a really intense project. It's extraordinary. The team is just, I just like, I, I don't even have words to express, like all of the different people that we're working with, including the vendors that we're working with. Everyone is just, like, it's a mammoth undertaking that we're doing on this project and everyone has just been rising to the challenge over and over again. But it's like, as a lead, I don't do most of the work. The biggest thing I do day in and day out is communicate with people and help remove barriers to them being successful at the things that they need to do. So I gotta make sure I'm tending to those relationships, right? So one, everyone's got, and I saw that comment, Nina, yes, five C's. <laughs> everyone has a shared commitment. They know why they're there and they're working towards the same goal. You're creating a safe environment for people to communicate and, and get, right, move, move out of the way whatever barriers there are for people doing what, they, what they're there to do. It's important that people know you care about them. They're not just some resource that you're using to accomplish your goal, that you're committed I believe, right? Anything I ever say to you is based on my beliefs, but I believe teams thrive when the people on the, like the leaders of the teams create an environment where their people know that they genuinely care. You manage conflict and also create an environment where conflicts are, are, are welcome. So long as the conflict is about the issues and not about personalities because conflicts can create new solutions. 
sometimes we get better results in an environment where there's a conflict and we just want to make sure that it's healthy conflict and that it's being managed. And then finally, and this is just my personal approach to doing things, but that there's an environment of coaching that you're ongoingly as a leader being in this space, looking at how do I ongoingly develop my team? How do I keep them clear and in action? What can I take out of the way that might be in the way of them performing? Because I choose to be out in life believing that most people want to perform and most people want to be their word. And most people want to do the things that they say they're going to do. That is my frame for life. I choose to have grace for people. And I also know, I also know that things get in the way and there are breakdowns. And so it's my job as the leader to move out of the way what's in people's way from their natural desire to contribute and be of service and do what they said they were going to do. Being a leader of a team isn't just being a leader for other people, it's also being a leader in your own life. So being clear about what matters to you and making sure, I love this, one of my mentors called it, you're chasing the tip of your desire. So are you really out in life doing what you love and what lights you up? Are you being accountable to yourself and to others? Are you someone who knows, you know, and you're constantly in the inquiry, where am I not being reliable to be my word in my life? And not from a place of making it wrong, but just looking. Looking for yourself. What's that about? Why am I reliable to be my word? And why am I accountable here, but not in these areas of my life? Trustworthiness is so important for others and for yourself. You have to have an environment that fosters success. So how are you organizing yourself and your time and your environment? And then finally, being a leader in your life for me looks like being adaptable. You're being flexible, you're committed, you're not attached. You're, you're kind of being, some people would call that being in the flow of life. And the last thing I just want to put a shout out for is accountability. I always kind of like to learn, like leave on a note, accountability is your insurance against failure. Let me say that again. Accountability is your insurance against failure. And not only that, it allows you to accomplish things much quicker and more enjoyably. So accountability could look like having alarms in your phone to go off for important things or meetings. It could look like creating a partnership with someone. I recently took on a goal of like drinking more water, like four liters a day. And my friend, like we message back and forth and every couple of hours, she's like the total of how much water she's drank. You're up, to, you know, you're, you're making sure you're updating things as you're giving your word to things. They're going in your schedule. Everything's getting handled. So I invite you to look again, where are the areas in your life? Where are the areas in your life where you have accountability in the areas that you don't? And what is there that you could notice about that? So after being here this morning, what's, one, what's the next action you can take? And you can put it in the chat or just write it down for yourself, but what's the next action you can see to take newly after being in this webinar this morning. So I know we're over time. I'm happy to stay if anyone has any questions, but if you have to go, I understand that. And just like from the bottom of my heart, thank you, thank you, thank you for some, Polly, your scheduling in 15 minute blocks. Yeah, if you want me to send you that template, please let me know and I can do that. Decomposing for Nina. What about you, Elsa? Scheduling and creating a goal. Really great. And like, look, sometimes we need some support with that. So if you need any support, you're surrounded by, I assert that you're surrounded by people who want to support and help you in achieving the things that are important to you. Lots of them. All right. Does anyone have any questions?
other than please send me the template, which I will. Oh, well, then we will just move on to this. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for everyone, for those who are here live and those who are watching the recording. For those of you who are watching the recording, if you'd like a copy of the template for scheduling, uh, ProSEP will make sure that you get that. And uh, just thank you so much for participating in this conversation and giving your time. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, whatever you're up to.